can tell you that uh, we're talking about seconds to react rather than minutes. A missile which comes in uh, less than 12 feet off the deck at uh, very high speed, many hundreds of miles an hour, uh, gives us a very short time of response. Come on, uh, el ataque contra Sheffield uh, fue hecho por dos aviones Super Etendar con un misil cada uno. Lanzaron los dos aviones simultáneamente a una cierta distancia del buque sobre un eco radar que habían tenido. The small number of people who saw this missile appearing only had time to. Uh, to say take cover and we're talking about three or four seconds later the missile striking HMS Sheffield there's no doubt at all that the Falklands campaign was it has to be said of great benefit to us it is desperately sad that one has to lose life in the process. But it gives us an opportunity to test our training, to test our men, to test our equipment under live combat conditions. The first of these tests came from this, an air-launched Exocet missile. From the attack on HMS Sheffield and other engagements, the Royal Navy learned important lessons during the war. Four years later, the evidence about these lessons comes from both sides, British and Argentine. All the Exocet attacks, including the one on Sheffield, were led by this naval officer, Commander Colombo. The Exocet missiles were fitted to Super 8 Hondar aircraft. The aircraft were designed to be flown either from carriers or from land. Sheffield, a Type 42 destroyer, was surprised with just four seconds warning. The question the British asked after the war was how a destroyer of Sheffield's class, designed specifically to deal with aircraft attacks, could have been surprised in this way. Why was the incoming aircraft not spotted on its long-distance air warning radar? In part, it was because Britain wasn't the only nation with Type 42 destroyers. Teniendo en cuenta que teníamos buques argentinos, destructores tipo 42, que eran exactamente iguales a los buques que teníamos que enfrentar, hicimos un estudio muy detallado de cómo penetrar por debajo de las defensas radar para poder hacer el ataque con los dos elementos más importantes que nos iban a asegurar el triunfo, es decir, la sorpresa y la discreción. A technique called pecking the lobes was what the Argentines had already practiced against their own Type 42s. The lobes of an air warning radar have a very particular shape. As the aircraft approaches the ship, it starts to enter the radar lobe. At this point, it's not in deep enough for the ship to pick it up. A radar warner in the cockpit tells the pilot to drop in height. By dropping in height, each time he pecks the lobe, the aircraft can escape radar detection almost all the way in. Then, at a range of 25 miles, it has to fire its missile. But to find its target, the aircraft has had to climb and for a few seconds it's been forced into the radar lobe. This is the ship's first real chance to spot the attack. In the operations room, the radar screens are under constant watch. This requires great concentration. What they're looking for is any change in the expected picture any unexplained blips which would suggest an enemy aircraft. There's the first in the top left-hand corner, the second and the third. 
Nothing that time. That's it. The aircraft has already turned back for home and the missile has been fired. It quickly drops in height to just above the waves. Exocet is a sea skimming missile designed to fly under radar cover. Sheffield's radar was somewhat elderly and the calm weather on that day allowed the missile to fly in particularly low. Nothing was seen on radar. But Sheffield had another way of detecting an Exocet attack. Every Type 42 destroyer has equipment on its superstructure for picking up the distinctive sound of enemy radar. This man has to identify the source. The first opportunity comes from the emissions from the radar dish in the nose of the enemy aircraft, which the aircraft uses to identify its target. To try to escape detection, the aircraft flies in with its radar switched off. But before it can launch the Exocet, it has to climb and locate the ship with its radar. This beam is switched on for the shortest possible time. In a few seconds, the ship should realize that it's under attack. The aircraft then feeds the location of the ship from its radar into the Exocet and fires. Two minutes later, there's a final opportunity to hear the attack. That's because the missile itself has a radar. This is used to guide the missile in the final phase of the attack. Again, to minimize detection, the Exocet flies in with its radar switched off. But with 30 seconds to go, the Exocet has to switch on its radar to hunt for the target. When it finds the ship, the Exocet locks on. The sound of the locked-on radar should be heard by the ship and is the final warning of an imminent attack. In the end, Sheffield didn't hear the radar of either aircraft or missile. Why not? In the minutes up to the attack, Sheffield was, by coincidence, transmitting on its satellite communications terminal. This piece of equipment. The problem was one of frequencies. The frequency of the Etendard radar and the frequency of the Exocet radar were blotted out by the similar frequency of the satellite terminal. Sheffield couldn't hear the attack because it had inadvertently deafened itself. Within three years, the Navy had its answer to a major lesson from the loss of Sheffield, specially equipped helicopters to provide an umbrella of radar cover. Inside this weatherproof bag is a radar scanner, which would provide early warning for a task force. The political decision to give the Navy's aircraft carriers their own airborne early warning was taken the day Sheffield was hit. Once the helicopter is airborne, the radar scanner is swung down to give a full 360 degree coverage. The helicopter then climbs to several thousand feet above the task force. At this height, Earth curvature is much less of a problem than at sea level. The two observers can see up to 150 miles from the task force. In this position, they can control their sea harriers, but crucially they can direct them out to intercept enemy intruders. With airborne early warning, no Super Etendar ought to have got within 150 miles of the task force without being spotted. In the Falklands War, the Sea Harriers had to work without such guidance. So what was their role in the missile age? We knew of Exocet, 
Of course, we have Exocet in the Royal Navy. And we had a part to play in defending against that threat. The Sea Harrier is the outer ring of defense of the fleet. And as such, we are there to shoot down enemy aircraft who hope to attack the fleet. For the Argentines, what was the most important means of eluding the Sea Harriers? Qué buena pregunta que me acaba de hacer. Realmente no se la puedo responder. Si yo le llegara a responder a usted esta pregunta, le quitaría mucho trabajo al servicio de informaciones inglés. A limitation to the Sea Harriers rapidly became apparent. With our little radar in the Sea Harrier. We couldn't see small, fast targets down low over a rough sea. This was a real problem and meant that uh, the Etondar coming in, in the right conditions, could possibly sneak past us and confront the missile systems, uh, which was uh, quite a worry to us. So what missile systems might such aircraft have encountered? Sea Dart was the main missile with the task force. It's a medium-range missile designed against aircraft targets at up to 30 miles. But of the Sea Dart hits in the Falklands War, all were against aircraft and none were against missiles. To stop an Exocet needs a missile system designed for that purpose. Such a system existed with Seawolf. The missiles are light, highly maneuverable, but short range. The Seawolf system was designed from the very outset as an anti-missile missile. The missile is uh, very high speed, flying uh, at more than Mark II, and therefore it's a very quick engagement at relatively short range, because the system engages its target at a maximum range of only five kilometers. And that's pretty much white survive stuff when you're watching the threat develop from inboard. The British problem was that only two ships in the task force had the specialist anti-missile missile, HMS Broadsword and the other Type 22 frigate, HMS Brilliant. How best to use these two ships became a crucial question. It became quite obvious that uh, one of the greatest dangers uh, was that we might lose one of the carriers to Exocet attack. And therefore, we stationed one of the Type 22s, either Broadsword or Brilliant, as close to one of the carriers as, as much of the time as we could, certainly during all daylight hours. The technique became known as goalkeeping. Three weeks after the loss of Sheffield, the limitations of having only two ships with Seawolf were to become all too evident. On the 25th of May, the unarmed merchant ship Atlantic Conveyor joined the task force, bringing more supplies, including helicopters and harriers. Unloading to the nearby carriers had not finished when the Argentines attacked. El 25 de mayo de 1982, dos aviones Super Etendar con otros dos misiles despegaron para atacar un blanco que según la información inglesa habría sido el Atlantic Conveyor. El ataque uh, se hizo por el norte de las islas y en cuanto a las características del ataque en sí, no difirió en absoluto del ataque al Sheffield. But to the British there was a difference. HMS Brilliant picked up the attack with its Sea Wolf system. The system responded exactly as uh, I would have hoped. It immediately alerted uh, onto the fact that there was a pair of Exocet missiles uh, streaking across the horizon uh, and put the Sea Wolf system straight onto it. On the other hand, the computer immediately informed us that it was outside of our range, no threat to us, um, and uh, there was no question of us being able to fire. It was too long a range for the self-protection Seawolf. 
Atlantic conveyor had only just arrived in the battle zone. Isn't the lesson that essential merchant ships should be armed? The Navy think not. And the reason we don't want to put defensive systems into merchant ships is not because it's difficult to put a small rocket system like Seawolf aboard the ship. But what it is difficult to do is to put this kind of monitoring system into the merchant ship so that the merchant ship is aware of what's going on. So she doesn't try and shoot down your own sea harriers, our own sea wolf missiles, all the decoys that are flying around, all the complexity of modern warfare. That's very difficult to put into a merchant ship. And a merchant ship armed with missiles that it could fire off against anything it saw coming could be a, a lethal danger to every other ship in the force. But had the Argentines planned to attack a merchant ship? Uh, no sabíamos exactamente qué era lo que íbamos a atacar. Uh, y como usted sabrá, en la pantalla de radar de los aviones uh, no aparece la identificación del blanco. Eh, fuimos a atacar en ese lugar porque sabíamos que algo había. Y uh, finalmente cualquier blanco para nosotros era rentable. Resultó ser este, que creo que fue muy rentable. Pero como fue el Atlantic Conveyor, según la información de ustedes, podría haber sido cualquier otro. The thought that it might have been an aircraft carrier highlighted the need for a last ditch line of defense. So the Navy's immediate reaction after the war was to fit this to aircraft carriers. It's for the last five seconds of a missile attack. In that short time, several hundred bullets would be fired at the target. The manufacturer's film shows that it can be done. But will hitting the missile always ensure that it disintegrates? And at such short range, will the debris be almost as lethal as the original missile? This is the only device credited with successfully foiling an Exocet attack during the entire war. It's a chaff launcher. It's not a missile. Chaff rockets burst near the ship, producing a cloud of fine aluminium needles. These needles reflect radar waves. And on an enemy's radar screen, the lower ship, which has just fired chaff, becomes completely obscured by a cloud of false targets. On the 30th of May, HMS Avendra was attacked not just by an Exocet, but also four Skyhawk bombers. The British believe Chaff saved the ship from the missile. We started off by firing a pattern of Chaff, and we turned very rapidly inside it, slowed right down, so that uh, because of the direction of the wind, I didn't want to get outside the pattern of Chaff that uh, the ship had, had sown. And we stayed there trying as far as possible to remain inconspicuous amongst all these cl uh, chaff clouds. Once we had the missiles coming in, then we fired another chaff pattern on top of the one we'd already sown, and that presented quite a large uh, number of chaff clouds for the missile to guess at. On this radar screen, the northern ship is HMS Exeter with its Sea Dart anti-aircraft missile. To the south is Avenger, which has just fired chaff. The attack is developing from the bottom of the screen. This reconstruction shows what the British believe happened. Captain White recalls the action. Round Avenger, the chaff pattern is now blooming. And for the first time in the wake of the Super Etendard aircraft, you can just make out four faint echoes of Skyhawk bombers coming in. The 
these have attracted the Sea Dart missile from HMS Exeter to the north, now passing the chaff plumes to the west of Avenger, tracking towards the pattern of four Skyhawk aircraft. It's just passing the Exocet missile, which is going north towards Avenger and her chaff plumes. And you'll see the Sea Dart missile there engaging the northwestern of the Skyhawk aircraft. It splashes, leaving three, which press on their attack. Meanwhile, the Exocet missile continues towards Avenger, curving slightly to the east and homing in on some of the chaff clouds to the east of the frigate. You see it passing through the chaff now, missing the frigate, and you'll see it come out the other side and splash harmlessly to the east of Exeter. Meanwhile, the three Skyhawk aircraft are going through the barrage of anti-aircraft fire put up by Avenger's gun. That claims one of them. The other two passed overhead, dropped their bombs, missed, I'm happy to report, and then wheeled off um, sensibly to Argentina. Originally developed in World War II, Chaff had an unexpectedly good war in the Falklands. Even so, current Chaff launchers are not very sophisticated. In particular, precise positioning of the Chaff cloud is difficult. Controlling the Chaff cloud depends on fuse time, and the only way to adjust that is by hand on deck. Not easy at the best of times. Since the war, Plessy have developed what they term seduction mode chaff. A computer in the operations room would take into account all these factors in order to time and place the chaff cloud precisely. The crucial decision on fuse time is calculated automatically. The computer decides when to fire. The aim is to do what was never possible during the war, to break the hold of a missile whose radar has locked onto a ship. A correctly placed chaff cloud should be able to seduce the missile away from the ship. Precise timing and placing are vital. The computer can show what the consequences would be of an error of just a quarter of a second in the fuse time. The chaff rocket explodes after 1.5 seconds. The chaff cloud is represented by a bar. And this starts to float into the rectangle representing the area in which the missile's radar is looking for a target. At this stage, the missile is already locked onto the ship. The wind blows the edge of the chaff bar into the area swept by the missile's radar. The center of interest moves off the ship. But because the timing was wrong, the chaff cloud leaves the radar rectangle too early. The missile's interest reverts to the ship. This is what it looks like from the missile's point of view. The chaff cloud hooks its attention, but can't hold it. The system's test will, unfortunately, be the next war. In the Falklands, the British lost twice as many ships close into land as in open ocean. The Navy faced a completely different set of problems in the confined waters around San Carlos. From a landing point of view, it was ideal because the beaches were of the right gradient and the right texture and were sheltered. On the other hand, uh, our greatest problem, as is widely known, was the enclosed circumstances in which we had to deal with this quite intense air threat. radars were almost useless in that very confined operating area. Uh, reflections from land cluttered the picture to an unacceptable degree. 
so that really all you could see was a sort of rice pudding effect on your ro radar screen, which made it very difficult to see aircraft targets, which were flying low, round corners, and coming at you from only two or three miles notice and seen visually from the bridge. On the first day of the landings, HMS Ardent caught the worst of these attacks from Argentina. Éramos eh, seis aviones en total, seis aviones Skyhawk A4Q, separados en dos secciones reforzadas de tres y tres, distanciadas diez minutos una de otra. Well, the, the first attack was by Navy A4s of the big heavy attacks. And indeed, I was talking to the ship's company uh, on, the, on the ship's main broadcast because it's a way of keeping the chaps down below aware of what's going on. And we hadn't been able to detect them on radar. And just as I was talking to the ship's company, we saw the, the Navy A4s because they're painted white and, and much more easy to see. La fragata intuyó, el comandante intuyó el ataque, puesto que en, al momento de cruzar los aviones por encima, <coughs> Estaba desarrollando toda su velocidad, tratando de ganar aguas abiertas. Es decir, una actitud lógica del comandante naval. And I turned away from land to give my weapons as much opportunity as possible and, and also into, into wind as fast as I could because this gives a high crossing rate which causes more of a problem for, for the chaps to aim. Cuando eh, mi eh, mira cruzó por el blanco, lancé mis bombas y comencé las maniobras evasivas imaginando que... Eh, desde la fragata estaban saliendo los misiles. And they dropped retard bombs. And uh, I think it was a chap called Philippi who was in the first one, and two of his bombs hit me and went off, uh, destroying my CCAT system. Indeed, the, I looked aft, and the CCAT launcher, which is quite a heavy piece of kit, had gone about 100 feet up in the air and was wobbling around up there, which was slightly bad news. We then received an attack from daggers. It was a, a confused attack, and we're still not sure whether it was four or five of them. Now, they didn't actually hit us with any bombs that went off, but they did hit us with some that didn't go off, but a lot of them sort of bounced through the masts and things. Then we had a final attack by more Navy A4s, uh, and they again hit us with, I think it was five bombs which went off down aft. I think overall we were hit by 11 bombs. Ardent sank just a few hours later. Its 1960s weapons and radar had proved inadequate so close to land. But Argentine pilots were not always so fortunate. At least 50 Argentine aircraft were shot down during the war. The Sea Harriers, although heavily outnumbered, were responsible for most of these losses. In the case of Ardent, Sea Harriers caught up with the Argentine aircraft just two minutes after the bombing. Y en, encontrándome desarrollando esas maniobras, sentí un fuerte impacto en la cola que me dejó el avión sin control, sin posibilidad de seguir girando o de hacer maniobras evasivas. El avión se encabritó, empezó a mover su nariz hacia arriba, temblaba. Eh, traté de corregir ese movimiento. Con las dos manos empujaba el bastón hacia atrás, tratando de volver el vuelo a la normalidad, pero el bastón parecía soldado al piso. No respondía a los controles. Miré a mi izquierda, vi un numeral haciendo escape, y miro a la derecha y veo un avión Sea Harrier que se aproximaba como si fuera para un remate. ¿Mm? Ya lo veía como se acomodaba detrás mío, así que dije, esto está todo perdido y eh, decidí eyectarme. The Navy were very pleased with the performance of the Sea Harrier. In particular with its handling qualities. It has a remarkable wing which allows it to be flown without trepidation at very slow speed. And of course it's got the fabled nozzles which allow you to decelerate very quickly and to give you one or two more advantages in combat. So we took advantage of its handling qualities at slow speed to develop the tactics that we use for the aeroplane in combat. 
no sea harriers were ever lost in air-to-air -air combat. Their main weapon was this, the Sidewinder missile. Most Argentine aircraft had no equivalent weapon. Considero que en la batalla de Malvinas, si hubo una estrella que eh, influenció el resultado final, esa fue el misil Sidewinder. El Sidewinder L asociado a cualquier avión hubiera desbalanceado en favor esa, ese combate. Realmente eh, contribuyó de manera significativa al mantenimiento de la superioridad aérea por parte de los eh, británicos. The British believe that their success was due in part to the tactics of their opponents. I think their command realized that as they were quite a long way from the amphibious landing point, 300 odd miles, they wanted to maintain their assets, keep them alive, so that they could deliver ordnance against the ground forces, rather than uh, play against Sea Harrier. I think it was entirely the wrong tactic, and I'm quite certain the Argentine pilots would much preferred to have taken on the Sea Harrier, outnumber it, and hopefully for them, shoot, shoot a few of us down. In San Carlos, Argentine Air Force and naval planes bombed British ships in repeated attacks. Some bombs missed their targets. Others were ultimately successful. But fortunately for the British, Ten ships were hit by bombs that did not explode. Why was this? Successful bombing is more than just a question of hitting the target. The aircraft delivering the bomb must escape the resulting explosion. To ensure this, the tail of a bomb contains a delaying mechanism. This starts with a propeller in the tail. As the bomb falls, the propeller is freed and spins in the airflow. Inside the bomb, it unwinds an arming fork. After precisely 16 and a half turns, the firing pin is freed. The firing pin is now separated from the detonator by just a light spring. When the bomb hits, the firing pin sets off the explosion. The ship's defences forced the Argentine aircraft down low. As a result, many Air Force bombs did not explode. When a bomb is dropped from too low a height, the arming fork doesn't have time to unwind fully. The firing pin is unable to detonate the bomb. Argentine naval pilots, however, had an answer to this problem. They were fitting special tails to the standard bomb. The result is called a retarded bomb. La bomba con cola retardada está hecha diseñada especialmente para ser lanzada a baja altura y el efecto de la retardante de la cola permite que el eh, avión escape a la fragmentación que se produce en el momento de la explosión. Concretamente, el avión lanzador va a estar aproximadamente 400 metros delante de su bomba en el momento que la bomba haga impacto. The retarded tail contains a parachute. With this relatively simple technology, naval pilots could attack successfully at low altitude. Had the Argentines solved their bombing problems, the Royal Navy might have lost the battle for San Carlos. Because of the intensity of the bombing, the British decided that they had to have earlier warning of incoming raids. To do this, they detached two ships. 
A Type 42 destroyer with its Sea Dart anti-aircraft missile, the one chosen was HMS Coventry, and a Type 22 frigate, Broadsword, with its modern radar. We could see a target over land, which the Type 42 could not, probably. Um, we had not the range of weapon to deal with it, but Coventry had in our case. And so we could electronically indicate what we were seeing on our system by data link straight into the Coventry's fire control system, and she could then fire CDART on that data with effect. This combination gave the British in San Carlos much needed warning. The two ships inevitably became targets. Ese día era el aniversario de nuestra patria. Dijimos cuando llegamos a la sala vamos a festejar nuestro día como corresponde. Los ingleses sabían que lo íbamos a festejar y mandaron dos fragatas, una serie 42 que era la Coventry y una serie 22 que era la Broswar como piquete de radar, o sea, para avisar todos los ingresos, ingresos de aviones de la Fuerza Aérea. On the 25th of May, we were attacked by simply two pairs of A4 Skyhawk aircraft. Eh, nos empezaron a tirar desde mucho antes. Eh, pegaban cortos los impactos. O sea, yo veía explosiones en el aire y el agua como si como si danzara, como si bailara el agua delante nuestro, pero corta, o sea que adelante. Y veíamos que esa pared, como pared de fuego, se, se aproximaba muy rápidamente hasta que entramos adentro de ella. And so we rattled off a seemingly inescapable wall of small arms led at this threat and were bombed. Tiré, pienso que corta porque tenía miedo de chocar contra la fragata. Salté la fragata. Miré por mis espejos y no... Ah, en el momento en que tiré, eh, sentí varios impactos abajo. Entonces dije, me dieron. Me dieron, pero le pegué, creo. Luck, or no luck, we, we were hit by one bomb aft, which passed right through the ship, having bounced off the sea, but it did not explode. Y yo grité, viva la patria, canejo, aprendan gringos de mierda. So you can imagine the situation at that moment. We'd had a failure with Seawolf. We were wrestling with it because we were aware of another raid coming out and we wanted to be ready to deal with it. We'd been hit with a bomb aft. There was a lot of activity to establish what we could still do having been hit. And I suppose for a moment or two, bearing in mind there were 100 seconds or thereabouts between the arrival of the two raids. I, I, I'm quite certain that momentarily I lost sight of the second raid until somebody said, aircraft green two zero, which was a visual indication from the bridge that to starboard by 20 degrees could be seen this other raid coming in. And my excellent team, and they were excellent, they were pounding the keyboard of this system of ours to bring the Seawolf back into uh, control, which they succeeded in doing, and we lined up on this approaching second threat. And I could, again, clearly see it coming in on the little television monitor that I could see from where I was standing in the operations room. And we were about to deal with it when, to my horror, I saw in the television screen, which was looking down the line of sight, the Coventry's bow crossed that line of sight, which prevented us from firing. And then seconds later, she was hit by two or three bombs and blew up in a very spectacular way. Coventry was the last destroyer the British lost in the war. The lesson for future warships is that they must be able to defend themselves independently. This is the design of the Navy's latest frigate, which will be in service well into the 21st century.
As a result of the war, it's a more heavily armed ship with a 4.5-inch gun and two different missile systems. Well, the initial design had no self-defense capability. It was built down to a very constrained cost. Way before the Falkland Islands, or it was decided that it would have to have some self-defense. And it has two missile systems in it. One for tackling incoming skimming, sea skimming missiles, a point defense missile system called the Seawolf. And one version of the Seawolf was, of course, used in the Falkland Islands in the Type 22s. And it has a surface-to-surface -surface guided weapon system, which can tackle surface targets some distance away. And in this particular ship, we have the Harpoon system. Harpoon is the American equivalent of Exocet for attacking surface ships. In front of it is the silo for a longer-range version of Seawolf to be launched vertically. And as a direct result of the war, the ship has a shore bombardment gun. But this is also the Navy's first frigate designed to reduce its visibility to enemy radar. The technique is known as radar contouring. None of the surfaces is a true vertical. None of the angles an exact right angle. What will an incoming missile see of such a ship on radar? What it will see is a very much smaller radar reflection and it will see it in a less consistent manner. It will see, we hope, uh, radar flashes, which could, of course, come from decoys or something of that sort. It won't be able to home in on a consistent thing it sees all the time. The missile manufacturers have also learned from the war. The latest Exocets have twice the range of those in the Falklands. And this is what the makers of Exocet have planned for the 1990s. It's a supersonic sea-skimming missile that can travel over 100 miles in around four minutes. It's called ANS. This missile is a uh, uh, high supersonic uh, speed missile. Uh, propelled with a ramjet. Uh, it will have a long range and it will be a highly intelligent uh, missile uh, which uh, combining this intelligence and the, this uh, high speed uh, will be capable of uh, overcoming the, um, uh, the new type of defenses uh, where the, the, uh, which will appear at the turn of the century. If we are uh, speaking of the present type of uh, countermeasures. Um, in other words, um, the um, uh, chaffs and um, jamming uh, devices, uh, decoys, etc. And uh, uh, if we speak of the uh, present type of uh, anti-missile missiles, which are originally anti-aircraft missiles, and uh, rapid-fire guns, uh, these uh, countermeasures of the, of the present time, I would say of the uh, 80s, uh, broadly speaking, they will be absolutely inefficient against ANS. To combat the next generation of missiles, other manufacturers have been developing sophisticated countermeasures. In this test chamber is the first active decoy designed to be fired from a ship. The decoy is specifically intended to divert an incoming missile by transmitting confusing signals into its homing head, which is why the system is called SIREN. SIREN is the first one that transmits an active signal thoughtfully from off board the ship. This means that it does not suffer from the disadvantages of being installed on the ship and then acting as a homing beacon. We put the homing beacon off the ship so that it can only be beneficial to the ship. Once fired, the siren round deploys rapidly as a result of a short burning rocket. It deploys a parachute a few hundred yards away from the ship. It listens for the incoming missile and then its own active side of it provides the messages back to the missile 
to say that it has got a better target than the ship and it seduces the missile away from the ship and towards the decoy instead. But could it cope with this? It will be quite easy to make a salvo of uh, several missiles arrive at the same time, so uh, saturating the, the, the enemy defenses. And uh, this will uh, be uh, all the more easy as uh, the time of flight uh, will be uh, relatively uh, short. The manufacturers of the active decoy are undeterred. Each missile, or several missiles at the same time, can be dealt with by a single siren. Each um, radar signal being dealt with one after another in very quick time, instantaneously to all intents and purposes. Much thought has gone into the design of the warships of the future. They will be fitted with sophisticated countermeasures. But will they survive in the age of the supersonic missile? In the aerospatial opinion, the uh, INS will be capable of keeping this, this lead of the offensive uh, weapon over the defensive weapons, uh, we think, for a long period of time, and uh, I think uh, well into the 21st century. The cost of testing the weapons and tactics used in the Falklands War was ultimately measured in human lives. Both sides felt that they fought for a just cause. The prospect of loss of life did not deter the combatants. We'd been born of a generation of fighter pilots in the fleet air arm who'd been engaged in many minor actions since World War II, and we'd been benefiting from all their experience and practicing their art. We didn't want to practice all our lives without fighting, so we were excited, a bit apprehensive, of course, but very keen that uh, it should happen. Si hay alguna enseñanza respecto de la guerra de Malvinas, como la veo yo, proviene del hecho de saber que uh, en lo que hace a la aviación naval hemos combatido contra ingleses que son verdaderos profesionales en el arte de hacer la guerra. Desde nuestro punto de vista, creo que los oficiales de la aviación naval que intervinieron también lo somos. Tal vez lo realmente lamentable de todo esto sea que nos hayamos tenido que medir en estas circunstancias. No le quepa la menor duda que si fuera necesario volveríamos a hacerlo. <risa>